This is Cruise Radio. Now more than ever, you should consider trip insurance for any kind of trip you take, not just cruises. Get a free quote at tripinsurance.com. Broadcasting from the tripinsurance.com studios in Jacksonville, Florida, this is Cruise Radio. Today's interview is Carnival Splendor. Dale joins us on the line to talk all about his cruise from Seattle up to Southeast Alaska. The ship is actually now in Australia, but uh, it spent the summer here uh, because, well, Alaska wasn't sailing. Dale, welcome to the show, my friend. How's it going? I'm great. I'm happy to talk to you today, Doug. So let's get some pre-cruise thoughts. What made you want to sail Carnival Splendor? Yeah, so basically we, um, we'd we actually booked to go uh, a cruise uh, this Christmas on the Carnival Magic out of uh, out of uh, Port Canaveral. And honestly, kind of waiting for that. And my wife and kids were so excited. Um, we got, we ended up getting a notification, you know, from Carnival saying that they had some discounts on Seattle-based cruises. And so we we looked up and said, oh, the Carnival Splendor is available and it's a really low rate. And so we actually booked this cruise with nine days before it left. So it was uh, kind of it was kind of the cruise to prepare for the cruise. Nice. Yeah. And you don't have to fly all the way across the country because you're up there in the northwest. And what is it about uh, 45 minutes or so to Seattle from where you are? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, depending on traffic, it can be about an hour. But um, the nice thing is that you know, living uh, kind of between Seattle and Vancouver I mean, it's not quite like living in Florida, but you know, during the summer, you get a pretty good option if you decide you want to do an Alaska cruise. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So how was the embarkation once you got to the cruise terminal in Seattle? You know, it was, it was great. It's, it, it took about an hour, which, which might seem long for some people, um, but ultimately the lines were moving pretty quickly. And, and honestly, most of the time was, having, uh, was you know, making sure that we had filled out the Arrive Can app correctly and that we'd done all the um, you know, pre-cruise uh, paperwork that Carnival requires. but um, so while, while there were lines everywhere, we moved through them pretty quickly. And I said, it took us about an hour. We, I think our boarding time was supposed to be one o'clock. And I think we ended up on just before two. How long did it take you to get from the curb to the ship? See, I would say it was probably just about an hour. Um, it was a little bit longer because since we live in Seattle, of course, we had to do uh, the parking and uh, the parking at least is very close to Pier 91 which is the uh, the north piers that uh, most of the cruise ships go out of, of course, Norwegian, and some of the smaller cruise lines go out of Pier 66, which is right on the Seattle waterfront. Carnival Splendor has been out of North America for a few years, and of course came back over the summer. What were your first impressions walking on board? Yeah, it's kind of funny. I, my, so I'll, I'll, I'll start out by saying I think the ship is really beautiful. I think Carnival's done a good job with it. But my first impression, and, and that of my family, was it's very pink inside. Um, if you've ever seen pictures of it, it's uh, decorate with a lot of pink circles with a uh, zebra with a zebra pattern in them everywhere. Um, but ultimately, you know, you kind of get used to that. And, and like I said, it's a, it's a really nice looking ship. Um, you know, it's, I think it's about 14 years old now, but they did a dry dock in, uh, I think they did it in 2019. So everything looks pretty good on it. Didn't really see a lot of wear and tear. Very nice. Yeah. That's one thing. I, I was on the ship in 2014 when it was in Manhattan for when Carnival rolled out the Dr. Seuss partnership. And that's the one thing that stuck in my mind from the moment I walked on the ship was all the pink everywhere, like the rose colored pink. Yeah. And I think what, what emphasizes that, too, is, of course, the two dining rooms are both uh, pearl. It's golden. Mm-hmm. I think it's the golden pearl and the black pearl. Yep. And so even the light fixtures. Uh, kind of, I think it kind of goes with the Dr. Seuss. It sort of looks like eggs uh-huh. uh, when you look at the light <laughs> fixtures. So uh, definitely emphasize it. But I mean, I will say, you know, having been on a lot of Carnival ships, I, I actually kind of grew on me over the, the week we were on it. Yeah, for sure. So what kind of stateroom did you have on this seven night cruise and how was it for y'all? Yeah, so we ended up uh, getting an ocean view. So um, like I said, we got a really big discount uh, going on this cruise since we went at the last minute. And initially we were actually even just going to get an inside but I ultimately decided we get an ocean view. It's worthwhile. I mean, I, I will say I've been on a few Alaska cruises. I certainly would say for anybody who uh, is going for the first time, I would certainly spring for the balcony. I think that's completely worthwhile um, because we've been up to Alaska a few times. Uh, getting in or getting an ocean view was actually okay as well because we were up on deck so often it didn't really matter. Yeah, for sure. And that money's better spent for excursions up there, too, because uh, Alaska excursions, they're, they're a pretty penny. Yeah, that's they right. are pretty expensive. That's <laughs> that, true. That's for sure. So let's talk about the food on board Carnival Splendor. We'll start at the, the Lido Deck Marketplace, the buffet area. How was it up there? Yeah, so I, I'd say overall, I think it's pretty good. I mean, I, one thing I noticed, particularly on this cruise, was there was a lot of variation in the food quality, particularly in the uh, the buffet. Um, like If you went to like the Carvery, that was uh, really excellent. The desserts were really good. Um, 
I, I kind of said that they, they sort of had like a pseudo Guy's Barbecue. It's not called by Guy's Barbecue on the ship, even though that is a carnival brand. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I think they call it Old Fashioned Barbecue, um, but they have the, uh, guys, the Guy's Barbecue sauces that they serve. Um, that was also uh, a pretty good. Um, but uh, overall, uh, I, think, I think the only part of the buffet that was probably kind of overall disappointment was they have the Mongolian Barbecue in there. Um, there was nearly always really long lines for that. And then um, ultimately, um, my wife found that that was a bit disappointing. But overall, I mean, I would say it was pretty consistent with buffet food. So there were some things very good and there was most everything else was at least average. And how about the poolside eats? So poolside, um, they have a uh, they have a guy's hamburgers, which, of course, is, is great. Um, and uh, that's actually where we ate right when we got on board the ship. They don't have a blue iguana. Um, but they do have the pizza place, uh, the I think it's El Capitano that's on there. That was very good as well. Um, I will say um, my boys expressed that they they think that the pizza on Royal Caribbean is slightly better, but I certainly didn't see them uh, resisting going to the pizza place quite often. <laughs> um, and then I, I don't know if I'd call it poolside, but they also have a Indian restaurant and a uh, deli that is uh, at the aft part of the ship right by... Uh, right by where the uh, adult section is. And so uh, so there was quite a, quite a bit of uh, variety there that I would even say to the barbecue, if you're not familiar with the Splendor, is a little bit of a unique uh, layout because it's actually on the floor above the Lido and you kind of have to go up the stairs in the Lido marketplace or take the aft elevators in order to find it. You know, that's an old school ship because it still has the tandoori back there. Normally that's the seafood shack on the aft end there instead of the Indian food. Yeah, the, the seafood shack is um, is actually at the second kind of the back half of the Lido marketplace mm -hmm. um, as well. And that, I will say that was also pretty good. Um, we actually tried the uh, the uh, peel and eat shrimp. We had the lobster one of the days and my wife got the clam chowder and she thought that was good. But yeah, it was, it was unusual to have the, the Indian restaurant. Um, I will say I think that might overall be some of the best food on board the ship. And they really had a, a good variety. It was a different menu in that uh, in that restaurant every day. I've only had the Indian dish a couple of times and it was very spicy. Um, and also the butter chicken was, or buttered, I can't, I don't know which one it is. It was amazing. So solid Indian food. How about the main dining room? What time dining did you have and how was your experience in there throughout the week? Yeah. So uh, we actually had late dining. Um, we, we did try to get to any time dining, but that, of course that was one of the downsides of, of booking the cruise so late. So uh, like I said, uh, the Splendor has two dining rooms. It has the gold and uh, the black pearl dining rooms. The Black Pearl is the one that's kind of midships, and that is the one that handles the anytime dining. And then the Gold Pearl is the one that's at the aft part of the ship, and that's the one that handles early and late dining. Um, I thought the dining room was actually really good. Uh, particularly, I thought the wait staff in the dining room uh, were excellent. In fact, my family and I ate breakfast there um, every day that we were on board, uh, simply because it was actually way more convenient to eat in the dining room. And then you didn't end up dealing with any crowds at the buffet. So, and then one other thing, because it was essentially you had three sea days, essentially you got three sea day brunches, which is also uh, something not to miss. You don't find that on every ship, a sea day brunch on every sea day. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, they, so they did the, the first, the first day was the, uh, was our first like legitimate sea day. Then we were cruising Tracy arm, which was essentially being treated as a sea day. And then uh, the last day of the cruise, uh, heading towards Victoria uh, was also treated as a sea day from that. So that was that was kind of unusual. And, and like I said, um, you know, the, I think the sea day brunch is something not to miss on board Carnival. Yeah. And there's one specialty restaurant on board, which is the Steakhouse. Did you have a chance to dine there? Yeah, we did. We actually uh, we actually went there um, the last night of the cruise. Um, very it was very interesting. Uh, the food in the Steakhouse was was absolutely great. Um, it was a little bit of an unusual experience for two reasons. Uh, the first was we were actually uh, in the harbor of Victoria and what we could see out from the steakhouse looked sort of like the ship was very slowly spinning around. Um, and then also um, kind of had an unusual experience because a, a, a very, very large table of people came in right after us. And so the wait staff ended up being uh, pretty distracted by that group. Um, it ended up being that we couldn't actually dock at Victoria um, because uh, they said that the winds were too high, but it was kind of unusual seeing the steakhouse, not really knowing what's going on. And you kind of see the same scenery passing through the windows every so often. Yeah, <laughs> as you're like, like one of those um, restaurants that spin very slowly. 
Yeah, it's very, very much like eating uh, eating dinner at the Space Needle. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's uh, that's funny there. So let's talk about the entertainment on board the seven night cruise. How was it for you and the family? It was really good. Um, first off, I'll say the uh, the highlight, honestly, is the cruise director. Uh, cruise director Andy, him and his whole crew staff were great. Um, we really uh, we really enjoyed them. Uh, he was very active about, on board. You got to see him everywhere. Um, he's really a funny guy. Um, but also, um, one of the things that I was kind of surprised about was the quality of the live music on board. I know carnivals come under some criticism sometimes for using uh, pre-recorded music in some of their stage shows, but they had some excellent live musicians. They had the, the violin trio. Um, they had a uh, the pianist in the piano bar was very, very good. Um, they had a few other kind of singer songwriters that did performances at various times. And even their house band uh, was also really good. So quite enjoyed that. And then the stage shows, they were very entertaining. I will say, I think the dancers, they might have been a little bit better dancers than singers, but but I think Carnival does a good job on their shows. Um, I mean, I think they're very, um, I think they know their audience. I mean, there was a, a show that was based on uh, the 70s, basically kind of centered on Studio 54. There was a show they call their Epic Rock Show, which is kind of, you know, late 70s and, and 80s rock, uh, particularly kind of some of the hair metal. Um, they do a show de- dedicated to 80s pop. And then they also did an 88 Keys rock and roll show. And the pianist from the piano bar actually did a pre-show for that. So that was um, hugely entertaining. And then, of course, uh, Carnival does a great job with their comedians. One of my boys uh, absolutely loves comedy. And so he basically made sure to hit just about every comedy show uh, that was on board. And and they were all very good. And then the cruise director um, actually did his own uh, comedy show the last night uh, of the cruise. and, And he was excellent as well. I think he actually had been a comedian before he became a cruise director. Nice. Now with this ship, it, um, before it went over to Australia, it did a dry dock in Singapore and Carnival did something a little bit different with the red frog pub on this one where they put it on deck four, kind of by the aft dining room. Did you have a chance to go through there? And is it like a, like a legit red frog pub? Yeah, it really is. Um, uh, my, neither my my wife and I are drink, but we actually did uh, go in there because they did a lot of the karaoke in there. Um, I think, yeah, but overall talking to people that, uh, uh, we're getting uh, drinks there. They uh, they quite enjoyed it. I think the the look of it was was really good. Um, it's a great venue uh, to do a bunch of different activities. Um, they like I said, they did karaoke in there, and I think they did the sports trivia every day was in there as well. So there generally was a lot of people in there, and and it seemed like the wait staff was great in there as well, getting people their drinks. And I, I know I think they brew uh, their own uh, their own beer on board as well. So did your sons take part in the teens club? They did. That was actually probably the single biggest surprise of this cruise is that my I have twin boys that are 17. And so they would have gone to the O2 club and uh, they tend to, you know, be kind of the the too cool. They don't really want to hang out with other other kids. And so I didn't expect them to go there a lot, but I, I kind of insisted that they try it out. And every single day they would go and participate in the various activities and uh, come back and tell us stories about some of the things that they had done. In fact, I guess they, uh, I guess that the uh, director of the teens club all kind of got in trouble because he had to do a scavenger hunt that sent the teens all over the ship. And so, <laughs> um, but they, they, they had nothing but good things to say about it. They, they absolutely loved it. Awesome. Well, let's talk about the sea days on this seven night cruise. It sounded like you had a couple of them. So how were they as far as crowds and congestion? Yeah. So I, I didn't feel like it felt like it was that crowd. I asked the, the, the crew and they said that the ship was about 80% full. Um, you know, one thing that I noticed was that um, other than the day that we left Seattle, where it was 90 degrees, uh, most of the weather was, of course, pretty foggy and cool, which is, of course, pretty standard uh, for Alaska. So there really weren't a lot of people up on the open decks. Um, and so w- one thing that was nice about that is that if you wanted to have some time to yourself or feel like yourself, you could go up there uh, and there really wasn't going to be a lot of people. But even in the main pool area, uh, there were really only a few times that the, cool, the pool felt crowded. And of course, they had the uh, the roof on over the pool for the duration of the cruise. And so, um, you know, it was good there. The only part I think that I would say felt crowded uh, were the hot tub on board. And then, of course, you could go to the Serenity adult area if you wanted to get away with that. And so that's where my, me and my wife spend a lot of time. But um, overall, I could, I mean, it looked like people were able to get deck chairs whenever they wanted. Um, I mean, there's always like a good crowd there, but it never felt. How was the Serenity area set up on Splendor? Is it divided? Maybe the word I'm looking for? Well, divided, sort of, yeah. I mean, the, the Serenity area is is uh, that, uh, at the back end, right after, like I said, right behind where the, the deli and the uh, the Indian yeah. restaurant are. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, they, they were, 
it's 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 divided in the sense that you know you, you kind of go through a little divided door to get to it. Um, I didn't actually see any carnival staff uh, validating that that there were actually were all adults there, but honestly, I didn't see any but who didn't look like they belonged there. And I don't know that a ton of people found it. It never seemed like it was that crowded. Now, one thing I will say is because of the weather, um, the pool back there was incredibly cold. So I wouldn't, mm. uh, wouldn't advise people swimming there, but the hot tubs, generally not a, not a problem to get into the hot tub there and, and, and not feel overly crowded. Yeah. Okay. As far as the ports of call, Tracy Arm Fjords, you also had Juno Icy Straight Point in Ketchikan. Let's talk about Tracy Arm first. Is that where the, you like go up to a glacier? Yeah, I think it's, I think, I believe it's the Hubbard Glacier that you sail up to. And so, you know, you start pretty early in the morning entering the Tracy Arm Fjord and uh, the ship, of course, slows way, way down. Um, you know, it's incredibly scenic, um, you know, lots of uh, beautiful waterfalls in the fjord, um, even though. Um, every morning was essentially uh, pretty foggy. Uh, it did clear up enough that we were able to see some wildlife and we saw some whales in there. Uh, definitely saw a lot of bald eagles. And um, I think uh, I know some people had reported that they saw either some porpoises or dolphins. And we actually saw some seals in there. But, uh, you know, you spend the entire day there. And then, of course, basically the highlight is, uh, you know, if they can get up close to the Hubbard Glacier, which obviously depends um, a little bit on how many icebergs are in the fjord as, as uh, some other ships learned this year got to be really careful in yeah. those, uh, a couple of years ago well i guess a few years back now i had some friends do um, a carnival ship like carnival legend i think up to alaska and they were saying that when when the ship got into the fjord they were able to do an excursion on a smaller like boat sightseeing boat big yacht type thing where it actually even takes you closer to the um to the glacier did your sailing have that opportunity if you wanted to do that yeah, our, our sailing did. Now, I, I will say the one thing is, unfortunately, that was not something that was available uh, for pre-purchase. And so, you know, as you know, when you book a cruise, a lot of times you can see the different excursions that the cruise line is going to offer. That one, you actually had to wait until you got on board to book. And and I didn't recognize that they were going to do that because I, I think that's this is the first cruiser I've actually uh, been where they actually did do the 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 big or the smaller boat. Um, I know that a lot of people on the cruise did do it, and they all uh, they all said it was great that they were actually able to get um, up very very close to the glacier, and uh, and thought that it was amazing. So that, that's probably my one regret is because I didn't see it, I didn't think to go down to the excursions desk and actually ask. And it wasn't until I actually saw the boat leaving, I'm like, oh, that would have been a cool excursion to do. Yeah. <laughs> so how was Icy Strait Point? Yeah, you know, so Icy Strait Point's an, an interesting uh, it's an interesting port because. I, I sort of feel, I don't know if you agree, but I sort of feel like it's the cruise line's attempt to kind of get a private island sort of port, mm -hmm. but in Alaska. I mean, so, um, you know, they're, they're still building it up, but basically it has two different docks. Um, there's a, um, a gondola that you can take uh, that goes between uh, between the two dock areas. So we docked first and then the, the Carnival Spirit came in a little bit later. And, you know, so they're building, they're kind of building the area up. So where we docked, um, there's some stores, there's a couple of restaurants. Um, there's a little beachfront area. Um, and then if you go over to, if you take the, the gondola across, then over where the spirit docked, um, that's actually where you can uh, book the different excursion opportunities. Uh, one thing that people told us that went to Icy Street Point with us was that the whale watching there was apparently phenomenal. I, I know they saw orcas and uh, I had a lot of people who actually said they'd been on multiple Alaska cruises and that was the best whale watching they'd ever experienced. Um, as for us, we actually took the second gondola, which goes um, up to the top of the mountain there. And then they have, um, I think they have six zip lines uh, that run down, that run for over a mile down. And uh, and so now I will say my boys, of course, waited till we got to the top of the mountain and then expressed that they would have liked to have gone the zip lines. And uh, they didn't end up going because we would have had to go all the way back down, get the tickets and then come all the way back up. So we, we walked around um, and kind of looked around. Uh, quite enjoyed it. I will say the uh, the excursion, if you want to call it that, that my boys enjoyed the most was that the cruise director put together kind of a, a polar bear dip uh, at the beachfront area. Um, I, apparently that wasn't an official carnival activity, so I hope I'm not getting him in trouble. But um, a lot of people went to that and that seemed like that was uh, hugely entertaining. A lot of people seemed to, to like that activity a lot. Well, just between you and I, and don't tell your sons this, but they missed one heck of a zip line. It was, I did it two times in a row. It was so much fun. Yeah, they, they actually told me that uh, <laughs> that they want to go back to make sure we go to Icy Street Point so they get to do it. it <laughs> I mean, it, as you know, it's you know six different zip lines uh -huh. right next to each other. So 
pretty pretty epic looking, I have to admit. Yeah, and you get some serious speed going down on those things. So your next port of call was Juno. What did you do there? When we booked this cruise, we have a lot of activities that we've booked on our uh, Caribbean cruise at Christmas. And so we told we told our kids that this was going to be very much relaxed. Like this is kind of the last uh, opportunity for them to get a good break before they start school. And and you know after being you know in in, in the house for several years now with the uh, with the pandemic, uh, we we said we're going to make this very relaxed. We're not going to book excursions in every port, but we are going to find fun things to do. And so uh, in Juno, um, we you know we went and did a little shopping. And then one of the things we got to do that we've never gotten to do before is we actually went to Tracy's Crab Shack. Um, the timing has just never worked for us. Either the line has been way too long or the times that we've had excursions have conflicted. So uh, as we did some shopping, one of us would go, uh, got in line about 45 minutes or so before it opened. And then uh, we went and had a great lunch there. And, and uh, my boys and my wife uh, really enjoyed that. So it was also nice because then after we ate there, we actually got back on the ship and were able to do some of the activities on the ship with, of course, a lot less people on board. And then your last port of call was Ketchikan. I have to admit, Ketchikan might be my favorite Alaska port. It's probably it's probably close with Skagway because, you know, Ketchikan, of course, is a is a very very little town, and so it's you know a lot of things are within walking distance. Um, you know, once again, we didn't book an excursion there. Um, we got off and we did a little shopping. Um, and we also uh, uh, you know did uh, walk along uh, Creek Street, which is also uh, you know, a fun experience. Um, you know, I would say that if you if you've never gone to Alaska before, I would certainly recommend doing, you know, either the Lumberjack show there, which is phenomenal, or um, to go and see all the different totems because Ketchikan has uh, a very high percentage of totems. And I think they even have a totem museum there, as I recall, but it's uh, it's pretty fun. Now, of course, Ketchikan ultimately was kind of a, a short court day for us because we arrived at seven and we're departing at one. So, um, you know, you got to you got to kind of decide if you're going to do something and, and get off the, the boat and do it quickly. So, yeah, it's uh were the salmon spawning when you were there on down. They were. On, yeah. yeah. Just, I, just, I mean, a, a, a very light because obviously it, get, they, it gets more into August and September when you tend to see them. But mm -hmm. I'd say we were there kind of right towards the beginning of it. So there were, there were some salmon um, in the, the waterway that, that Creek streets built over. It's so neat to watch them swim upstream like that. So you make your way back to Seattle. How was the debark? Yeah, debark was really, really smooth. I mean, so obviously, first and foremost, since we didn't actually stop in Canada, um, you know, really, uh, I mean, you know, we got basically waved through customs. So I wasn't sure if they were using the facial recognition or not. But I mean, there was really nothing for customs to check with us. Um, what, since we didn't have any flights we had to catch and we weren't in any hurry, we were one of the last groups to get off the ship. So uh, basically, we went up on deck. Uh, it was really kind of cool because Seattle uh, was celebrating uh, it was celebrating I can't, oh, seafair is what they call it. And it was Fleet Week. And so they had a uh, right docked right next to us were a couple of U.S. Navy ships. And so we just kind of spent time, uh, you know, looking at those, waving to the sailors on board and just waiting for our, our number to be called. And then, you know, once once we got off the ship, I would probably say it was about 15 minutes from when we got called until we were. Um, at the curb site, waiting for our shuttle to go back and get our car. Wow. So you made your way right through there. Yeah, yeah, very, very fast. I mean, one thing that's advantage too is that uh, you know the day that we debarked and the and the and the, bay that, uh, the day that we uh, are in, sorry embarked and debarked, we were the only ship that was at that dock. So that mm -hmm. that made it very smooth too. I've been there at times when there's two ships, and that can be a little more chaotic. Yeah, you know, definitely. I remember going when I sailed out of there. There was like a a Carnival ship two Holland America ships and a princess ship in one day. And it was a hot mess through there for sure. I, I would imagine. Yeah, it was a uh, sure was interesting. So uh, I didn't ask you back on board the ship. Did you notice the smoke? Um, how was the smoke situation in and around the casino? We crossed through the casino. Uh, I would say several times every day. Didn't really notice the smoke uh, uh, hardly at all. There was only one day kind of about mid cruise where we could smell smoke at all as we walked through. But Overall, I didn't think it was bad. Um, I, it was very interesting. I didn't see um, a, the casino seeming like it was very busy most of the time. Now, I probably wasn't walking through there late at night, but like during the day, it seemed very quiet. But definitely um, didn't smell the amount of – I didn't smell the level of smoke that I would have expected from a, a ship that's the age of the Splendor. Okay. And then how about the Wi-Fi? Was the Wi-Fi pretty strong on your sailing? Uh, no, the Wi-Fi was probably the, the – uh, uh, was probably about the weakest part of the cruise. So I, talking to the crew, 
uh, they had said that the week we were on and the week before uh, that they had had pretty bad Wi-Fi experiences. Um, you know, ultimately, I don't know that it made that big a difference because we could, of course, connect um, to cell towers when we were in the, the various Alaskan ports. Um, but certainly if it had been a, you know, a, like a Caribbean cruise or Mediterranean or something would have been a lot more problematic. But um, they, like I said, they said that it was, uh, they said they had really bad Wi-Fi during those two cruises. And I don't know if that was, uh, you know, just something unusual or if, or if they were experiencing some sort of technical difficulties. There was, they definitely didn't make any announcement about it, but they were joking about it. If you would talk to, especially some of the entertainment staff. Yeah. Well, how about first time tips to offer anyone considering jumping on Carnival Splendor? I would certainly get the balcony. And then, um, and then I would just say, if you're, if you're going to Alaska, you know, as you point out, the excursions uh, do cost a lot, but I think they are very worth it, especially if you can do any of the excursions that get you up on the glaciers, Mm -hmm. you know, and you know, you can go up to Mendenhall Glacier. um, And, you know, and, and those I think are incredibly worthwhile because it's just amazing to see how much, you know, how much uh, the glacier changes the land. And then, also, if you end up going back, it, you know, unfortunately, you can also see how the glaciers have been retreating over the last several years. Yeah, it's pretty wild. I mean, I, like, I remember my first time there, I think, was 2000 and it was either 2010 or 2012. And then going to Mending Hall, Mending Hall Glacier in 2019, just those seven or whatever it was, nine years since I've been there before was insane, like how much it's retreated. Yeah, it, it really has gone gone far back. But I, yeah, I think I would think the thing is I would definitely tell first time is do spend the money on the excursion. Mm-hmm. They are they are very, very worthwhile. Yeah. Um, I, can, I can truly say I've never had a bad excursion on any Alaska cruise I've ever been on. Well, looking back, what was the biggest highlight of this cruise for your family? Overall, I would probably just say just exactly how relaxing it ended up being. I mean, uh, you know, when we came off the cruise. Uh, everybody talked about how much they enjoyed it. Um, it was, you know, uh, nobody got upset at each other because it wasn't like we were feeling overbooked. Um, I will say my boys would probably say the fact that they they uh, got a ship on a stick. They uh, <laughs> I have two boys that love trivia, and so they were participating in nearly every one of the trivia events. That's awesome. Um, and but I mean, I think I think just the fact that you know arriving in each of the ports, um, we didn't feel hurried, so we could wait for the initial rush of people to get off, and then we and then we would get off and and just walk around, and it just made for a very relaxing vacation. And then especially if you you know just enjoy watching the world go by, sitting. When the, when the ship is sailing and just seeing all the the wildlife that you will experience going into Alaska is just incredible. It certainly is beautiful up there. What are your final thoughts of Carnival Splendor? You know, like I said, uh, I, I really do like it. Um, uh, you know, it was uh, one thing that uh, I had pointed out to my kids before we got on is that, of course, it's it's actually of the Concordia class. So uh, one of my kids is, uh, is very strongly into history. So uh, he was he watched some uh, videos about the cost of Concordia, but um, but really, it's a, it's a beautiful ship. The staff was tremendous. Um, I mean, like I said, the food was about what I expected. It was, um, you know, the steakhouse was great and other things were generally pretty good. Um, but I think overall, I would say the thing that made that cruise was just just the incredible, um, the incredible staff. They really were amazing and they really went out of your way to make sure that you uh, enjoy the cruise. And, and I think that makes a huge difference no matter what other um, what other amenities that a cruise ship offers. We've been talking with Dale about his seven-night cruise to Southeast Alaska aboard Carnival Splendor out of Seattle. Dale, thank you so much for stopping by and giving this review, my friend. Well, thank you, Doug. I really appreciate it. Have a question or a comment for the show? Yeah! Send an email or voice memo to Doug at CruiseRadio.net. A big question we get at Cruise Radio is, how do I know if I need trip insurance? Simple answer. If you're getting on a plane, taking a road trip, or getting on a cruise ship, you need to have travel insurance. Hey, it's Doug Parker for my friends at TripInsurance.com. Not not only does TripInsurance.com protect your vacation investment, but it also gives you peace of mind in case anything were to go wrong on your trip. How do they do it? They offer three different types of trip insurance policies. Good, better, and best. One policy for every vacation budget. But it doesn't just stop there. They're up to 40% lower when you shop around on other comparison sites. Plus, TripInsurance.com offers 24-hour customer support before, during, and after your trip, online claims assistance, and travel alerts to let you know what's going on at your destination. But find out for yourself. Check out TripInsurance.com. All right, Dougie, let's see what we got for you, buddy.
Cruise Radio is produced at the TripInsurance.com studios in Jacksonville, Florida. Get cruise news, ship reviews, and money-saving tips every Thursday on Cruise Radio. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show. If you want to help spread the word, give Cruise Radio a five-star review. Find Cruise Radio where you listen to your favorite podcast or online at cruiseradio.net. I'm your announcer.